day to come together and worship God. Glad we've got uh, visitors in our midst. You are always welcome. We hope you feel that and not just feel like it's empty words that uh, we mouth from time to time. But it's great to have you as part of this assembly. God is our audience today. We have those uh, listening by way of radio, some watching live uh, through uh, internet. Some will be watching or listening to these lessons uh, maybe weeks, months after the fact. So we're thankful for an opportunity to get God's message out and in the wonderful context of our assembly. We are missing those in Nicaragua, uh, confident they're doing great things, very different uh, circumstances they'll be gathering today. Much good that we uh, are anxious to hear about once they return. Continue to pray for them. I know you are uh, thankful for the, the good and the, the potential to change lives that, uh, that they're acting on uh, even at this hour. We invite you back tonight at 5 o'clock, next opportunity. Wednesday classes, a lot of good things going on. Camp will be next week, uh, starting Sunday. So it uh, seems like every, every week, the rest of the summer, certain things that uh, we're trying to emphasize and some highlights of, of good things going on. This morning in our study of the Word of God, I want us to look at, kind of based upon the, those couple of passages there in Job, a theme of remembering the poor. Remember the poor. That's actually a phrase in the Bible in Galatians 2, verse 10. Paul is there talking about uh, meeting with the, the chief leaders in Jerusalem and uh, the, the different kind of the, the workload sharing they had there. And they mentioned in addition to the teaching of the gospel that part of Paul's ministry would be to remember the poor. And Paul said, I was eager to do that. I, that was not a, a burden on me at all, something I was already participating in and, and motivated to, to be about. Romans chapter 15, 26, you notice that as part of his teaching at his different ministry, uh, the missionary journeys even, he is collecting relief, collecting funds for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And so when he's coming back, sometimes directly and other times indirectly, there are those that are helping to alleviate a pressing physical need that they have. Sometimes maybe we've, uh, we've imagined wrongly, falsely, that you can either do spiritual things in service to God. You can teach and preach and build up those who are already Christians, or you can help charitably. You can help alleviate physical needs. And sometimes we haven't seen or don't appreciate how they go together. It's not a matter of picking one or the over the other, but doing both of them to the, the honor and to the glory of God. And so I'm presenting this lesson not because I feel like we are pitifully failing at this, but rather emphasizing even as we have folks that at great expense and great inconvenience to them are helping folks. Uh, you know, down in South America, there are those in Luther, Oklahoma, that have gone not just to help poor folks, but part of that ministry, have a heart for that. There are those on a weekly basis here in Gallatin and in Sumner County are eager to help people who are impoverished, maybe those momentarily afflicted with, uh, with the loss of income. We can never have hardened hearts to the plot of those who are near and dear to God. If I say that God is concerned about this category of people, that is true, but God doesn't look at people as categories. God sees names and faces. He knows them personally, individually, in ways we never will. And so may we appreciate that God knows who the rich are and the poor are. He's equally concerned about not just the, the physical state, status of any of us, but but above all, our spiritual status as well. The Bible talks about poverty or the poor about 230 times. Just that sheer number of references helps us know this is a Bible doctrine. I don't know that uh, maybe you've heard a full lesson on that or not. But I think it's time that we emphasize that. You know, as we think about different standards of rich and poor, hasn't that differed? Doesn't it still differ by history? At different eras in time, you know, it's, it's the case that some may be relatively wealthy, many people, and at other times maybe not so much. And so kind of depends on where you are. 2015 is a different measuring stick than uh, people that have lived in past generations there. Some of that is geographical. And so poverty in United States of America different than poverty in some of the third world countries. And so while we have poor, some of them would be very wealthy compared to some in, in other places. It kind of depends on where you live, doesn't it? As you think about time, I guess our family would be fairly poor compared to those of past generations. And the reason why is because we don't own any livestock. I don't have a cow. We don't have sheep or goats. 
And in some of those societies, it kind of measured that. How much, how much cattle do you have? If you've got a lot or, or some, well, you're fairly wealthy. If you don't have any, you're poor. We've got a couple of dogs, and they're really not that productive. About all they do is sponge off of us. And, and so I don't think that would really uh, rate us uh, on this scale of wealth or poverty, do you? And so it's even within classes, there are those that would be regarded as poor uh, and others as rich. And I think about different causes of poverty. Do you realize that some of those are external and some of them are internal? Why are there poor people in the world today? Sometimes it's because of oppression. You think in times of war how that some even fairly, fairly wealthy or at least middle income lose it all pretty quickly. Maybe a despot, a fanatical ruler could cause ruin not just to other nations, but even to their own people. That's not hypothetical. That has happened, and sometimes that can cause at least temporary uh, poverty for those folks. Sometimes it is laziness. That's an internal. People just don't want to work. We'll be looking at uh, some things about that. It is within their control to, to have and be more stable. They're, they're uh, kind of uh, reneging on that, um, that responsibility. Sometimes people are impoverished, again, looking at an external because of things beyond their control. It may be a change in the weather. There are some farmers that uh, maybe are praying for good weather, just the right amount of rain. I don't want to flooding my fields. I don't want a, a drought either. And so they could be temporarily impoverished. Maybe that, that would last beyond one year. And so they don't have the resources to recoup if that's going to last a third. And so, yes, they're, they're poor. In a few years back and a few years forward, they may be very wealthy because of bumper crops. But... But sometimes it is those things. could be a hurricane, a flood, tornado. Those things can, uh, can wipe out uh, sometimes a, a lifetime of, of, of accumulated wealth, even a fire, obviously. There are those who are poor, not because they've never had money, but because they've had it and mismanaged it. Sometimes either location or allocation of funds can, can render us poor. We'll be looking at a very familiar story I guess the, the most popular one in all the Bible, you think about that prodigal son who his problem wasn't that he didn't have, it's that he couldn't keep and uh, squandered uh, those possessions though. And so let's talk about some causes of poverty. In uh, Proverbs 22 verse 2, the Bible says that the rich and the poor have this in common, the Lord is the maker of them all. On one end of the spectrum, the rich and the poor, they have something in common. Wealth is not their commonality, but, but they have this in common, that God, the one God, made both of them. By the way, he didn't necessarily make them either rich or make them poor. It's just that people in that definition and, and that uh, kind of challenge among social classes, that is all because of God. He's the maker of both of them. He didn't make one to the exclusion of the other. Hannah was praying in Second, I'm sorry, First Samuel chapter two, in verses seven and eight. Here's this woman, remember, that was childless and begged God for a son that she wanted to return back to Him in her prayer of thanks when she finally conceives and is pregnant. There's something she says about poverty. There, I want you to see that in verses seven and eight. She says to God and about God, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. God makes poor, he makes rich, he brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap. I don't know that Hannah was trying to, in a very inspired theological way, weigh in on, uh, again, differences among socioeconomic classes. What I think she basically is saying is God has, is a God of reversals. Here is my poor state. Here is now my elevation. I'm praising him, not gloating over that, not bragging about me, but, but understanding that God is behind that. Sometimes he brings low those who are high-minded, egotistical. Their pride can be a downfall even in regard to their, their wealth there. Causes of poverty. Proverbs 20, verse 13. Do not love sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will be satisfied with bread. 
when Solomon is talking about sleep, he's not saying don't sleep at all. Obviously, God created us to need rest. But he's talking about those who, in a lazy frame of mind, sleep longer than they need to. They, they have no desire to get up and, and be busy and to work. Not surprisingly, 3,000 years ago, Solomon says, I can see, anybody can trace the end of that. If you aren't willing to provide for yourself, you're going to come to poverty, generally speaking. But if you open your eyes, get up, apply yourself, you will be satisfied with bread. We live in a day and time, kind of like those in, in Jesus' parable in Matthew chapter 20, when uh, you got the laborers in the vineyard, some very early are rising and they're going out and and working a full day, and others different times during the day, even past lunch time, finally are being pressed to, to go and, and work in my vineyard. I'll pay. And that very startling conclusion to it, remember when the owner of the vineyard gives everybody, one's working a full day, 12 hours, one's working one hour, they all get the same pay. And to us, that is totally unfair. It's not the major point of the parable, but he is referring to something probably common back in the first century. Some were not that motivated to provide for themselves uh, or their families there. There was a danger in 1 Timothy 5.13 of some of the younger widows, a, a temptation maybe for them to become idle and for them to not support themselves to the degree that they could. Obviously, God has means of their family members, and even as a last gap measure, the church coming forward to make sure that they didn't die uh, in their poverty. But he also highlights um, a regard for them to be as responsible as they should. And then listen to Proverbs 28, 19. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows frivolity, New King James, will have poverty enough. I've never tilled land. I've been on a tractor a little bit. Don't know that I could operate one now with a lot, without a tutorial or some, some guidance there. But, but he's talking about that agricultural society. If you, as a farmer, simply, and they didn't have tractors back then anyway, did they? But if you'll do that, if you'll plant your uh, crops, you'll be able to eat. If you're following just frivolous things, you're looking at anything other than work, don't be surprised. If your belly is growling, if you look in your closet and all of a sudden you don't have any clothes anymore. There's an incentive over and over in Old Testament to work, to provide for yourself, to, to realize it's not a curse, but a blessing, obviously. Proverbs 23, 21 says, The drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty. Drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. It hurts our hearts to see people who could be and should be providing for themselves and their family, but they waste it on things, again, that aren't going to help. And the, the uh, gluttony and the drunkenness, these dangers that aren't just ancient ones, but even modern ones, cause people at least uh, at times to, to realize, I don't have enough to support myself. Often the wisdom to, to see what I've got and what it's going to go for and how much it's going to cost me to live is, is a reason we can avoid poverty there. You find a unique situation, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 talks about it, where some of the Christians convinced that God, Christ, were about to come any time, evidently sold their possessions. They just quit working. They're sitting around waiting on Jesus to come back. Paul had to write and correct that wrong notion and he said, pretty graphically, didn't he, there about in verse uh, 10 through 12, if any will not work, neither what? Neither let him eat. Don't think you can sit around since Paul gave several conditions. These things have to happen before Jesus comes back. He never told you to be idle there. But you know what? If you as a child of God, if you're not going to work, don't expect someone to give you a handout. That's pretty firm, isn't it? And yet Paul meant business there. Some people are poverty stricken. And it's their own doing. They can't blame the externals. They can't point the finger at anybody else. It's poor choices that they have made. We are to remember the poor. And sometimes in remembering them to realize some don't want help. Was it Lyndon Johnson, former president, that says we have de declared unequivocally a war on poverty? I wish, I can't remember the year that uh, statement was made. I wish 
that that battle had been won. I wish we could say, you know what, since we've declared it, poverty is not going to fight back. Everyone will be open to the idea of, of being middle class or being as wealthy as we can. Some people, you just can't make do the right thing. That was true in the Bible times. I believe it's true today. And I mention that because some people need to, to realize and, and own up to the responsibility they have for their problems. But I'll just give us some cautions about poverty in the next place. In 1 Corinthians 13, you know that is the what chapter? The love chapter. Paul is talking about the superiority, the beauty, the grandeur of love, agape love. But he says in the first verses there, if I were to give my body to be burned, and even before that, bestow all my goods to feed who? The poor. But I don't have love. If I were to do good things in the absence of love, Paul says it profits me nothing. Get nothing out of it. There's no benefit. There's no value to it. And so what he's saying is do the right things. Do good and even charitable things, but do it from the motivation, the highest one, of love. I need to be open to the, the plight of those who truly are needy. And not to be like uh, you think of the rich man in Lazarus, that parable in Luke 16. Here is a poor beggar laid at his gate, wanting, begging just for the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. You don't get the idea that the rich man took notice of Lazarus. Both of them die. And both of them go to, to the two great extremes throughout eternity. And the rich man is begging for Lazarus to come and dip the tip of his finger in water. Cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. He's told that's not going to happen. Son, remember, in your lifetime, you had all these good things. Lazarus didn't. And I think it's implied, obviously, the rich man should have, could have, needed to, to be uh, open to and, and obviously know about him and alleviate the suffering of this man. That, again, suffering probably through no cause or fault of his own. Circumstances beyond his control. I don't want to be a person who would look at a truly needy person and say, you know what? Fix it yourself. You know what, I, I've got my things, and God's given them to me, and I've worked hard for them. You take care of you. God says, you know what, these aren't, last Sunday sermon, even your things, Brian. These are my things. These are ours. As a steward, use those things to the, the glory of God there. Here's an interesting thing in Proverbs 38 and 9, where the writer says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. God, if I had my druthers, I wouldn't be on either end of the spectrum. Help me to be middle class, if you will. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest, look at the dangers on either end, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or, lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Most of us don't have to pray, literally, God, I don't want to be rich or poor. We're kind of right there in the middle, even by about any any standard or definition in modern America. But the writer says, you know what, there are particular temptations if you have a lot or if you have a little. I don't want to be plagued by either one of those temptations. God, I, I want enough to get by, put food on my table, have clothes on my back. Obviously, the necessities in life, if God showers any luxuries my way, helping me to appreciate them, use them, but realize again, that's not the chief end of life. That's not the measuring stick. That's not defining who I am or my worth in society, even though the world doesn't really see it that way. And so let's talk about number three, and finally, compassion to the poor. This is the longer point, a lot of verses. Some of them, not all of them in the Bible we'll look at, but there are admonitions, Old Testament, New Testament. We're living under the new, so we'll, we'll get to those uh, in just a moment. God, what kind of provisions did you have even within your law, Old Testament Israel, given by Moses to take care of some that would be on that scale? By the way, you know, a lot of people today, even in our country, wish and, and are pushing for an equality in wages. And, and really their thing is if everybody could be the same, if we could take all the money and pull it together and then dole it out so that every family has the same as everybody else, that would be ideal. 
That's been tried in the world today. To my knowledge, every time that's been tried, it hasn't really worked out. I don't think it can work out. You know, when Jesus has the sinful woman, or rather, uh, on this occasion, the, the woman anointing his feet there toward the end of the Bible, he talks about, uh, in response to the quibble that Judas Iscariot gave, why was, this, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Sounds like a great thing. All the other apostles are probably looking at Judas Iscariot and saying, yeah, Jesus, what about that? Wouldn't that be right? A lot of poor folks could be blessed by what that ointment cost. Jesus wisely said, you know what? You leave her alone. She's done a good thing for me. He goes on to say that the poor you have with you always. There will be plenty of other opportunities for you to help those who are poor. Jesus did not go around teaching and preaching and say, hey, if you've got something, you indiscriminately give it to everybody else. Let's get everybody equal. One thing that I think God knows is even if you do that, some folks having the same amount aren't going to use it wisely. It'll be gone anyway. Kind of spinning your wheels to try to make that ever work out. There'll be some that'll be ingenuous enough to take that same amount, invest it or, or to grow it and and so there's always going to be somewhat of a scale there. Not always right. Not always that the poor uh, ought to be looked down on. Not always that they ought to be helped out when, uh, when they have their own responsibilities. But here's where I'm coming to. Back in the Old Testament. Look in, uh, for example, Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field. Nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, and you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. Why? Moses hears God say this, You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Read, yes. All of it, not quite. Most of it, yes. Why would I leave it? Well, because some people are poor. They don't have a field. They don't possess land that you do. They are dependent on your generosity, on your leaving what is God's for them. Not so that they can be encouraged to, to remain in poverty, but to alleviate, in this case, what would be true hunger. Read it again with me in Exodus 23, 10 and 11. Here's the same class, different scenario. He says, for six years... You shall sow your land, gather its produce, but the seventh year you shall not let it rest. Be fallow that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. And so not only just yearly leave some for poor folks and strangers, but on the seventh year you don't even plant. I think the assumption is some things are going to grow naturally. Who's that for? The poor folks. You've had six years to store back some of that grain and produce. That will help even the playing field. It will be an advantage to them. You know what? They still got to go out and glean it. There is still work for them to do to secure it. That is a different uh, maybe departure that many at, uh, look at today, but at least they're taken care of. You know, this, uh, this law comes into play in the book of Ruth, doesn't it? You've got Ruth and Naomi, her mother-in-law. They, they leave. Naomi and Elimelech and Malon and Chilion, they leave Bethlehem because of poverty. They're poor for a time. They go into to Moab there, and, and the husband dies, the sons die after they've married the daughters. And so Ruth goes back with Naomi, and she is gleaning in the field. These two ladies didn't come back and, and say, hey, y'all guys, give it to us. Here's our address. Leave it there on the doorstep. Better come in and, and hand feed us. No, they are still working. That's their responsibility to go out and to provide for themselves. In the context of that, God is, is preparing this, this man, Boaz, to, to take under his wing this righteous, godly, motivated woman to be part of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. And so what I'm saying is that law was still being adhered to. She was able to do that along with others as part of God's compassion there. Our reading in Job, if I could go there and make reference to it once more. Verse 12 and 13, 
when Job's friends are trying to get at the bottom of why he's suffering so much, he's lost his children and his possessions, he's covered head to toe, uh, toe with these painful boils. Job, it's because you haven't cared for the poor. I mean, they're throwing everything at him, hoping something's going to stick. Nothing really did. And, and Job, in chapter 31, starting in verse 16, basically says, I don't know what you're talking about. I know that I have cared for poor folks. I have, uh, I've delivered them when they've cried out. I've been a, a helper to the ones who had no help, been a father to them. And so part of Job's relative righteousness, I believe, was his attention to ones who were much lower on the economic scale than he was. Understand that as a tribute as a high mark in, in the, uh, the integrity of this man that, that we look up to there. Further references to compassion in Proverbs 14, 31, he who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. I don't know how much more clear that could be. If I oppress the poor, if I look at their plight and, and actually try to intensify it, make it worse on them, Solomon says that is if you are doing that to God himself. How would that work out? Not good, is it? That shows the close connection God has with, with his people there, doesn't it? Proverbs 31, 20. Remember the, the virtuous woman? The woman of valor, part of why she was is because in verse 20, she extends her hand to the poor and she reaches out her hands to the needy. Bless members like that, women and men who similarly see others and sometimes because you've been there, you know what it's like. You have a motivation to do it. Sometimes because you haven't been there and you don't ever want to be there, out of the appreciation for that, it's easier for you to say, Lord, help me to be a blessing to these people. Doesn't matter your background. Everybody expected to do what they can in those, those situations. In Luke chapter 3, verse 11, you got John the Baptist. You know, part of his preaching, the repentance and the baptizing and all that, he, he said, if you have two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. And a society back then, again, which you would measure your wealth, not in the matter of, of houses with multiple rooms and different things, but just a meal and two changes of clothing, be alert, be on the lookout of those who truly have the, 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 the uh, needs, physical necessities that, that you're able to bless in that way. In Matthew 25, maybe the high water mark of what we're looking at to illustrate the, the importance of this, when Jesus is giving a glimpse into that final judgment scene, that second coming, and the division of the sheep and the goats, he says part of that criteria of God's blessing upon the righteous is this. The ones he's going to say, come, you blessed of my father. In verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. And remember how Jesus on that occasion had a comeback from these folks. They're saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and, and thirsty and naked? And when did we see you like this? And the answer is, inasmuch as you did it to who? The least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Why would I remember the poor? Because I want to show Jesus love. If I would help Jesus out, if he were living right here in my society today, if I saw him hungering, thirsting without a tunic or something, would I give it to him? All of us would say, yes, yes. Jesus says, look not to me, but to anybody else in a similar situation. You give to them, you're giving to me. It's that important. It's that important, isn't it? I need to be compassionate. I need to remember how Jesus said to the ones turned away, the ones who wouldn't be entering the heavenly portals, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. Thirsty, no drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. A stranger, you didn't take me in. When did we see you like this? Inasmuch as you did not do it to the least of these, my brethren, you didn't do it to me. That's pretty serious. 
That's our glimpse into judgment. Among the other things, that's not the sole criteria, but it is a criteria. We had better be in our own generation compassionate to the ones who need it. Let me close with this. The poor need this. What do poor folks need more than anything else in this world? Would you think about that as I give you a Bible answer? Is it a, a, a nice meal? Is it a gift card to an expensive restaurant, gas card, rent paid, utilities or something? What do the poor need more than anything else? Luke chapter 4 verse 18 quotes Isaiah 61 as part of the ministry and the, the message of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord, Jesus said is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel, notice, to the poor. Preach the gospel to the poor. He's sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives and on, but to preach the gospel. So, Jesus, you preached only to poor folks? No. But I didn't neglect them either. God knows that all people, the rich, and the poor and somewhere in between need the gospel of Jesus more than anything because it's going to transcend heaven and earth. It's what goes beyond the material that we are part of today. Aren't you glad we can do that? Preach the gospel of the poor. In Luke 14, 21, didn't he in that parable of the Great Supper, when the invitations were handed out, I want all of you, I've got this big spread here, the feast is ready, and and they're making excuse. We can't come. We're busy with that. But the master is told, the servants, you go out on the highways and the hedges and you compel, you make these people come in. No class distinctions in the church. In God's kingdom, we can almost be, as we ought to be colorblind to racial things, we ought to be as blind to how folks are dressed, how much they have, where they live, and things like that. I know it's a challenge. Most of us would say, I've got work to do in that. Let's do it. Because the best thing I can do to a poor person, to a middle class person, a rich person, is not just to help them physically, but to assist them spiritually, to get them in touch with Dr. Jesus, who is able to bless them with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. James chapter 2, I'm going to close here. James 2 verse 5, ask a question. It's an age-old question. It's a, it's a pertinent, relevant, modern question. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he's prepared? The applied answer to that is yes, he's chosen them. Not them exclusively. But I dare not neglect anybody and withhold the powerful, life-changing, soul-saving gospel. Have you availed yourself of this salvation today, regardless of who you are or where you come from? It doesn't matter what your age is, whether you're male or female, black, white, red or yellow. We are all one in Christ Jesus. In Galatians 3, God's desire is contingent upon our belief and our baptism to add us to his family. We are sons and daughters. We're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. As many of us as baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And again, those classes, those distinctions melt away. They pale in comparison. It is great to be a Christian. Today, if you're not one yet, please leave here saved. Please leave here knowing. I have done what God in his grace and mercy and love has asked me to do. How he wants me to be part of this spiritual kingdom. Be blessed today. Come while together we stand and sing the song.